Good evening, everybody. Uh, the other day, I had uh, provided some comments about critical thinking and Sanjay Mehrotra, who's been in touch with me for many years, he had a question uh, in relation to climate change. So I've given him some thoughts, but I sort of collected uh, the outline of the main theory into a little dot points. And I want to talk about it so that you can actually think about it um, in a critical way. So let's uh, see what's the issue with the uh, global warming. The, everything goes on and everything keeps changing, climate changing, and we don't really care about it. Uh, we can manage it, we can adapt to it, etc. So wh what are the two main issues with climate change? The first main issue that most people are really uh, afraid about is that it will burn up the earth. Effectively, it is that strong an effect that the entire earth, uh, the atmosphere will warm up so dramatically that it become impossible to live on earth. Okay. Now, we know very well uh, that human beings live all across the planet in extreme climates, really negative, uh, you know, 25, 50 degrees centigrade, all the way up to 50 degrees uh, positive. We have a variation of 100 degrees. So as far as humans are concerned, that's not really an issue. Uh, if, let's say, it warms up dramatically in one part of the world, uh, I'm just giving it an example. Let's say it becomes 70 degrees. Then other de other places which were like minus 50 degrees would become minus 30 degrees. So it's still pretty cool. And so people can move there. And people have moved all over the place. Humans have gone from Ice Age. They've managed all these things. It's not a real issue for us. The real issue is for the, the, the natural plants and animals, these, these, these uh, you know, organisms do not have the capacity to adapt and many of them will therefore die. So that's the, probably the major, major concern. It's, it, it's the, the economic effect on humans if a uh, you know, major issue occurs and the uh, significant effect on animal and plant wildlife. So let's say that that's overall it's a very significant issue that you know if the if the climate warms up by 20 degrees it's quite a big deal uh, we should therefore think about it you know we should be we should prepare for it we should uh, ask questions we should even prevent it if possible so i have no issues with that if if it is a major issue what if it's a minor issue and that's probably uh, where you know the ipcc other reports are saying it's going to be about two to four degrees higher by the end of the century let's say that's their assumption that they're finding and i will actually come to that and i will question that itself but i'm not at the moment i'm, I'm saying let's start from the very beginning and what's the biggest problem and let's say it's a medium sized problem two to four degrees okay it's uh, going to affect some minor islands here and there water will rise this that and so people move here and there a few of them uh, and therefore the world GDP will come down by what let's say 2% of what it would have been at that time um, 100 years from now is that a major issue for us uh, to bother about well obviously that's not a major issue why not because in the hundred years humans would have if they continue prospering at the rate that they have and in fact if they follow good governance and good principles of education and other things they would have increased their incomes by six to eight times which has been the history of the last century and even i mean that's modest the countries like china etc have shot up even much more dramatically let's say a modest country uh, would grow at two to three percent um, over the years and would end up having increased its per capita incomes by about six times in a century this is an average you know where if you have if you've got high population growth that doesn't work and so on and so forth but let's say an average of five to six times you've increased now People who have increased their income and wealth by five to six times from what they are today. And these are people in the future. You know, they are well into the future people and they'll be extraordinarily wealthy compared to us. Now, their income might come down by two to th two to four percent, let's say. Hmm? And some people have to move from islands to some other places. So is that a big issue? I don't think so. I mean, if people who are extraordinarily wealthier than us, if their incomes come down by two to four percent after, you know, 100 years, really does it matter to us are we supposed to be sacrificing anything at this stage for the sake of those people who are extraordinarily wealthier than us i don't think it makes sense okay so that's where let's say these are the two major scenarios of climate change uh, the way the global warming issues that we hear about i will now come to the uh, you know the the actual science behind it and then we'll basically rebut the entire idea as being nonsensical and a bit of a fraud uh, political nonsense and so on and so forth and we'll come to that in a systematic way. So the idea here is critical thinking. The idea here is we need to really go through the entire science and look at the data. Okay, so am I questioning greenhouse effect? Am I uh, creating new science here? Am I saying the earth is flat? Of course not. 
you know me i'm actually totally a, you know a fanatic about science i actually am a i'm a maniac about science science has to be carefully examined and it's it's evidence and data are very important its theories are very important for us and so there is a greenhouse effect there is no doubt about it uh, there is no doubt about it that if there was no greenhouse effect the earth would have been so much so cold and bitterly cold we would probably not have existed uh, the whole thing would have been radically different it's the fact that there are these greenhouse gases which allow us to have at least 15 to 20 degrees higher temperatures than what they would have been otherwise and that's fantastic okay so we need these greenhouse gases around us to keep us warm and to keep this earth livable so i'm not debating the greenhouse effect i'm not contradicting i'm not saying it doesn't exist and how does it work it's very straightforward and it's really important to understand how it works i'll, I'll explain in a simplistic manner you can actually look at uh, many videos and uh, documents and see how it works more carefully so the 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 uh, electromagnetic radiation visible and non-visible um, invisible let's say that's coming from the sun there's a lot of lots and lots of it of different uh, wavelengths uh, it, it has it, it has this photons vibrating at different levels of energy okay so each of these various greenhouse gases and there are lots and lots of them the water is one of them methane is another and then there are other types that i, I can't really repeat right now I, I i don't remember but there are many other greenhouse gases okay let's say all these greenhouse gases and they all have different isotopes and each isotope works differently what happens is that these the these greenhouse gases have a particular property all of them have the same property essentially they absorb photons from a particular particular wavelength so it could be high wavelength or low wavelength uh, of light uh, or uh, or invisible uh, in uh, electromagnetic radiation what they're doing is that when that let's say there's a series of atoms carbon dioxide atoms let us take carbon dioxide that's the one most commonly used in the debates now that is stacked heavily at the at, towards the earth there's lots and lots of carbon uh, dioxide atoms uh, around us although that's 0.03 percent of the total atmosphere this is a really tiny amount but let's say there are many many atoms <clears throat> you know stacked between now and let's say half a kilometer and then there are a bit fewer atoms uh, of carbon stacked vertically upwards beyond that and so on and so forth all the way to say 100 kilometers above us and then they start really fading out there's hardly any carbon atoms after that so what we see now is that the the ray of light that's coming from the sun let's think of light for example rather than thinking of uh, different you know parts of the electromagnetic spectrum so let's say one ray of light falls from the sky and it has to it hits one atom okay it hits one particular atom now it's got a lot of chances of hitting something it's got lots of atoms and um, although atoms are really small and they're diffused etc light uh, uh, hits one of the atoms let's say now it's hit it and its photon in a particular wavelength is absorbed by the carbon dioxide uh, molecule that is called an excited state of the photon and it's it's basically got, uh, gone up the 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 electron or whatever i think the it's probably the electron that bumps up a little bit i'm not sure of that remember i can't remember the details right now but the atom gets excited uh, there's an increase in energy and and that's basically absorbed from this so that particular light which had that energy okay remember light has got both the uh, wavelength properties and that of a particle and so the particle properties are absorbed in this case the rest of the light still goes through there's an energy an energy property that's absorbed so some of that is absorbed the rest of the the particle uh, light still goes through presumably the different parts of the wavelength of that light but some part of that energy is absorbed in the in this carbon dioxide now over the course of the day and it's pretty random it can occur after two hours six hours eight hours 12 hours or whatever the atom finally is the the photon finally is ejected from the carbon dioxide molecule it's a delayed process and then it uh, it, it uh, comes back to the normal state of excitation or whatever the energy in the electrons and so on and that photon is ejected when that photon is ejected and often it happens at night uh, that that energy that was captured by the carbon dioxide is released and you get it as heat in the atmosphere at night okay and this generally applies as i said it can happen two hours six hours or whatever so the energy this this is pretty random and it can happen anytime so even during the day you get a bit of the effect and at night you definitely get a bit of the effect of that warming from the uh, greenhouse gas but not one very important thing here okay that light which has got rid of its atom while coming into uh, a photon while coming inside the at, uh, earth 
has actually now got no more energy at that level at that point it's got nothing to to contribute it's it's basically going through it might catch another greenhouse gas and therefore some other part of it might go somewhere here and there but basically it's now got less energy than it had in well it, well it entered the earth's atmosphere now therefore what we're saying is that the the uh, atoms of carbon at the top more area topmost area of the earth's surface will absorb almost all the earth's all that particular radiation that's coming in they will absorb and they'll get excited okay the ones at the top by the time the thing reaches the bottom area of the earth the surface of the earth it's actually got very very little energy left the, the energy that's coming from the sun it's much less than what it was at the top and that's what is left and so carbons are the carbon dioxide molecules are saturated essentially that energy has been absorbed very little so the, the there's nothing coming in if there's nothing coming in what can be absorbed nothing much right so that's the kind of uh, effect which is a rapidly decaying effect so the first few let's say molecules of carbon in the atmosphere create a massive effect relative to others okay uh, of greenhouse gas the next hundred let's say hundred molecules the next hundred will be half of that effect or less and then another quarter and, and or less and so on it rapidly tapers off the effect the more and more carbon dioxide you add in the atmosphere does not mean that there is a direct effect on the temperature all right so the greenhouse effect that's the standard formula what i've given you nothing but the standard formula so i'm not debating the greenhouse effect what i'm saying is the greenhouse effect rapidly tapers off after a particular level and it tapers off it is the current impacts of climate are very off a doubling of the uh, uh, carbon have been estimated to be just one degree you know so when when let's say there's zero carbon okay uh, and then it become 400 parts a million uh, which is the current level then let's say about 350 to 400 let's say that's what happens uh, then the temperature goes up by nearly 15 degrees okay the next 400 it only goes up by one degree you see the point i'm making that the effect of this carbon is extraordinarily low after a point now all that is good that's one of the greenhouse effect but what about the whole uh, you know atmosphere and and how does it work is it only the carbon dioxide it's only 0.03 percent of uh, uh you know one percent basically 0.03 of uh, percentage of the entire not percentage the proportion of the entire uh, uh, of one sorry of one percent of the atmosphere is a really really tiny quantity okay it's therefore 300 parts in a million so that's the 0.03 percent of one percent now there are obviously many other factors you have the the sun uh, which is the basically heating up that uh, the planet uh, that's the, really the solar effect how how strong is the sun you have the magna inside the uh, earth's uh, you know core that's heating things you have the distance of the sun of the earth from the from the sun but not just that you actually have effects of how the whole solar system is behaving in relation to other other uh, solar systems in the milky way and as a result you start having those ice ages and other things which we still probably don't understand very well but let's say there are many effects but don't forget simple things like uh, you know um, water molecules water molecules are both greenhouse effects but they also create clouds and clouds uh, can dramatically reduce the coming incoming rays of the sun so there are this huge number of what you call effects that are taking place on on earth at the same time which then lead to a particular natural outcome of say whatever the 15 degrees above what it would have been without the greenhouse gases so now we have arrived at the thing that this is very complex so even though carbon dioxide might create a one degree effect in 100 years after doubling let's say we double in 100 years which is probably not going to happen given the kind of you know alternative energies that are coming in the into play at the moment let's say even if it doubled it's one degree what the argument is that there's a feedback effect and the feedback effect i won't go into details but that apparently will create the extra two or three degrees heating of the entire atmosphere okay so now what we see is that okay if you're a great scientist and i i think this is rock this is the real rock solid science that underpins these independent uh, contributions then the question is how does it work together and for that you have to have a climate model or you have a, an extensive equation a multivariate equation and all this stuff and then you have to have a predictive kind of a climate model and then you notice that science is basically all about prediction don't forget that anything in science is has to be 100 percent true and we're talking physics here we're not talking you know biology and economics and all those kind of uh, other things we're talking pure physics in or chemistry or whatever and this has to be 100 percent accurate
accurate if you're really good. So you might have a single isolate a single carbon carbon effect of greenhouse gas or another greenhouse effect, but you can't add up the whole thing, including the sun's uh, you know motion effect, the the motion of the the Earth's effect, the volcanoes, the uh, you know the motion of the Earth around the solar system and and uh, also around particularly the solar system around other systems, and so on and so forth. There are many and the clouds and cosmic rays and the whole lot. I mean we won't go into details. So that whole thing is known as a climate model. Now. Climate models, one would assume they would predict correctly the effect of the uh, all these variables. But guess what? All of them, and there's no exception here, all of them have over predicted what has actually occurred. So it's now been more than 30 years since we have had climate models. We have got about 30, 40 climate models. It's not just one, but all of them are making this. Not one of them has predicted the actual performance of temperature on Earth. By the way, in this particular regard, let me quickly add, this is not that simple. The, even the measurement of climate, of carbon in the in the atmosphere is a very complicated thing and, and people can disagree with that because it's not easy to measure, okay? So we're talking of fundamental issues about that. We're talking of many other fundamental issues in this whole business. But let's say for simplicity's sake, you can somehow measure the temperature of the Earth. Now that's another one, temperature of the Earth, but the heat island effects and the kind of fraud that's occurring in the, in this, in the, in the you know, uh, the bodies, meteorological bodies, many of them, and others in terms of measuring temperature. Even simple data are being politically manipulated. But let's say even if you accurately, even if you assume that they are all right. So you have two types of measurements. One is on Earth, one is on satellites. And, and satellites presumably more independent than the ones on Earth because that Earth is contaminated. Let's say I'm not going to do any of the details. There are a lot of details here. But simplistically speaking, let's say that these climate models should have predicted at least somewhat within the range of the actual reality. But they're all overestimated. They're all wrong. In science, we say one thing. If your empirical evidence or your prediction has come out to be wrong, you actually have to go back to the drawing board. Your theory is wrong. What has happened here is that the, the climate scientists have not yet mastered the entire effects of different things on the climate. They simply don't understand it. And with that lack of understanding, they've been making a bit, a bit of a noise and so on and so forth. And I come to the political aspect of it and why they're doing this because they need all this taxpayers' money uh, and a bit of a massive fraud going on. But let's, let's say that if the climate models are wrong, they're all wrong, okay? The whole thing is wrong. Now, when I started this, studying this whole issue, my questions were in relation to simple things like, okay, climate, carbon and temperature, what's the correlation? And if you go back in time, you find there is absolutely no correlation. The carbon effect on the climate is extraordinarily small. I mean, it is only one of many other effects. Yes, the greenhouse has, has an overall effect, but the, but the overall effect does not mean that there's no ice age or something. You know, things can go down by 25 degrees, the temperature on Earth, even though carbon is very high. So we've had cases of ice ages with very much higher levels of carbon dioxide than we have today. Okay, how do you explain that? No, they can't. Next, you have this situation that today, from the Earth's origin, when the Earth started, this is a bombardment from all over the, you know, the uh, Earth was very small, it became much bigger uh, over the course of time with the accretion of meteorites. It's a collection of these asteroids, really, if you think about the history of the Earth, it's a collection of asteroids and then collection of all these comets that came and provided water, more or less. That's a summary. And it grew and grew and grew. At that time, it was really hot. And it was bu bubbling out volcanoes and magma, was, and volcanoes are nothing but carbon. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of carbon in that and that carbon got sequestered and that carbon was nearly six to eight times what we have today okay that's the level of carbon in the air at that time many 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 many, many billion years ago four three four billion years ago then the carbon started getting sequestered by the rain as it started raining it, it converted into uh, you know carbonates and that went into the into the water and the water then uh, uh, you know converted into that uh, absorbed in the form in the form of uh, uh, rocks and and various uh, you know uh, such things as well as the biological organisms which absorbed a lot of it and that again became sediment in the in this in the ocean so a lot of that carbon in the air has been sequestered and today we actually have one of the lowest levels of carbon dioxide in the entire history of the earth at the and the levels are so low that if you give plants, the plants of around us are effectively starving, okay? They're starving. If you give them a little bit more carbon dioxide, they flourish. And guess what? Farmers do that. There's a greenhouse, uh, greenhouses which are actually, the greenhouse effect comes from the greenhouses which are actually used for agricultural purposes. Farmers have greenhouses where they put in extra carbon up to about 1,500, 1,500 parts per million. 
they increase the, the current levels by five times or four and a half times sorry there was uh, the the, uh, the camera's film stopped or or i think limit was reached it's about 20 minutes i understand now and i seem to have reached and exceeded that limit so i've got to restart from where i might have left off and i've actually lost probably i don't know how many minutes of my talk uh, let me do that again so uh, let me continue with the point that i was talking about uh, regarding the carbon levels being one of the lowest in Earth's history. So this is something you can all go and verify. Okay, so uh, essentially what we're saying here is that carbon dioxide is uh, is very powerful at lower levels of concentration, becomes much le much less powerful as it increases, and at the moment it's extremely low in terms of capacity to influence the Earth's temperature. And and I won't go to the feedback issues and so on. I don't even remember what I've actually said. I've said a lot of scientific things, but at the moment I'm assuming that I've covered all those issues. I've got to rush now. So the other the, the point I just want to mention quickly is that the IPCC's own reports, if you go back in time, they clearly mention that the current at uh, the end of the 20th century heating uh, warming was much less than the warming in the in, in the medieval era as well as in the uh, Roman era. And then there's so much overwhelming evidence about this thing. So there's there are hundreds of studies which show that. But then this comes this uh, man uh, called Man, M-A-N-N. He's a so-called scientist who did his PhD on some such uh, on studies with uh, tree rings and then comes out and proves apparently that there was a massive, uh, you know, there, there was no medieval warming, there was virtually no Roman warming and everything has actually happened only now. And that paper uh, was very uh, attractive to the IPCC and other politi political uh, fellows who wanted our money and therefore they published that and became uh, and Al Gore used that to create panic in the world. And so that's complete nonsense. That's a false uh, study that's been rebutted many times uh, uh, since then. And there was definitely an ice, uh, a global war, uh, medieval warming. Then there was an ice, a little ice age, and from which we are recovering at the moment. So if you look at the data, we are very consistent with the fact that we are recovering from a little ice age that was there uh, in the uh, towards the beginning of the 17th century, I think. It's about 220 days ago. Uh, check the data. So uh, what I've just mentioned here is that the climate, the climate science, the, the real science does not tell us anything that there's any even a, even a modest level of a problem. Forget about the major issue. There's not even a modest level of a problem. It's a, it's a standard set of warming. And yes, there is a very tiny, my personal estimate of the warming caused by the uh, carbon dioxide since we've started putting much of it in the atmosphere is that we might have increased the global temperature by 0 0.15 degrees centigrade. That's what I can, uh, using my very simplistic but scientific analysis of data, I've come to that view, okay? And, and, and I'm, I'm not uh, even persuaded that the Earth's uh, temperature will rise by more than, ha more than one degree, uh, another one degree uh, by the end of the century. So it could go up to two degrees according to the IPCC, but I don't even think so. Think so. They need to get back to the drawing board. The science here is very complicated, and at the moment, they're completely overestimating the, the reality in terms of temperature. Uh, one of the, well, the other point that you'll note is that much of the uh, changes that we've observed in the 20th century, they're consistent with the effect of the solar, uh, uh, solar um, spots, sunspots and, and sunspot activity. So looking at that data, there's some papers which, which, uh, which suggest that it's actually even the, the minimal effect that we see here is explained by the solar activity because they, they argue that similar effects are seen on Mars and Mars has got no effect of uh, man-made uh, you know, carbon dioxide. So if you're seeing some warming on Mars, then definitely there's an issue here which is beyond that of uh, the local man-made uh, you know, carbon dioxide. So look, there's nothing to see here. Uh, the, the science is uh, uh, not yet, uh, scientists are not yet mastered the, the entire story. They can't explain um, temperature, even the normal temperature. They can't explain ice ages. They can't explain virtually anything about the climate, which is really conclusive. So they're still studying. Uh, at this point, we, we uh, have conclusive evidence that the, the problem is very modest. Um, and if at all, it's a problem. Uh, we don't think it's a problem because, you know, this hardly anything, if you can say 0 0.15 degree increase, um, it's not a problem at all. So that's the science behind it. Okay. Now comes the politics behind it. And I think I mentioned uh, briefly about the politics, but the politics is really worth looking at because the IPCC is a uh, 
United Nations body uh, and it doesn't have it's basically a bunch of uh, bureaucrats representing their country who constitute the IPCC and they use some so-called scientists but the scientists are there and as you see um, this is what I, I thought at least there were some real scientists operating in that space it turns out that there are many of them are not even scientists and uh, I did I discovered that by reading uh, Donna Love from Boyce's book uh, Donna Love from Boyce's book is called um, the delinquent teenager who was mistaken for the world's top climate scientist. We know about the Pachori character uh, from India who was you know, caught into uh, various sexual abuse allegations and uh, basically had to leave. Uh, th these are a bunch of fraudulent fellows sitting in the IPCC, uh, alleged scientists uh, with very limited uh, ability to understand real science. And uh, the, many of them are uh, lobbyists and so on. Uh, I won't name it, but I think it's a World Wildlife Fund was one of them, but there are many others like that who are actually creating a hype about things you know putting pictures for uh, falsifying the story about polar bears and the whole lot these are self-interested people who want money for themselves and if you look at the whole, whole history these so-called scientists and these politicians have all invested in solar sh solar shares they've all got vested interests in uh, you know these organizations like world wildlife fund etc where they from which they get paid these are the guys who are influencing this political organization called IPCC. Now you can imagine the kind of science that's going on here. So the idea also, for example, that 97% of the scientists agree with this whole thing being a you know, big issue and caused by man, etc. That itself, that paper itself is a fraudulent paper. You can have a look at that paper. It's very obviously fraudulent. Okay, So I won't go into details here, but you can see there's a lot of politics uh, playing out here. And the politics is playing out because just like any other thing like religion, for example, where people simply believe that somebody else has seen a god, you know, or this, some angel comes and tells them something, you know, people are really gullible. They just believe anything you tell them. Uh, it seems to me to be that rather than check anything. So this is where these uh, IPCC have taken advantage of the people's gullibility to create panic when there's not the slightest case for panic. They've been touting falsehoods. They've been publishing falsehoods and they've taken the world for right and they've taken their money as well they've taken your pocket they've taken as i said if you are not going to be doing critical thinking uh, you your pocket will be you know made much lighter that's what's happening in this particular space of climate change and finally i would encourage uh, everyone who's watching to consider uh, subscribing to what's what's up with that what's up with that is a is a uh, is a kind of a blog created by i think anthony what's his name um, and he's he's actually a, a, a terrific scientist. He's he's he also brings up together a lot of other real scientists who question and and challenge. And there is so much to challenge. I mean, it's virtually an infinite exercise to rebut the kind of nonsense that is being touted in the so-called political circles, uh, which is now contributing to the uh, very high increased cost of energy, uh, the renewable energy subsidies, and all that comes from this climate change hype. Uh, but also the fact that you know, uh, a lot of young people particularly are very deeply misled about this thing and they, they've they got some very crazy ideas and they want to do recycling when they're actually not economically viable. They've just gone overboard, even though the basic environmental issues are still untouched. Many of them are really the, the hardcore issues of environment need to be looked at. And for that, we need from really good science because good number of species are dying in front of eyes. That is caused by real man-made problems solutions to that are also quite different and that's not related to the so-called carbon so carbon dioxide hype has actually created a kind of a cloud of mindless uh, cloud in this in the mind and covered the eyes of the people the young people in particular and they are unable to see through the reality of the fact that so many animals are dying and we need to save them but we need to save them using economic logic and rather than some you know passion and such things we need a lot of intelligence and a lot of uh, critical thinking even to do that I think I better uh, you know and now there's so much to say but I can probably talk, come, to, come back to this later uh, in terms of any particular detail that anybody would like to dis, me to discuss. All right. Thank you very much.